like to move like a tiger up and down the hall uh, to sort of prowl on my prey, that is all of you guys. Uh, but uh, I'm supposed to sort of move, my degrees of freedom is only this uh, small patch. Sorry, uh, you can move the sorry? sorry you can yeah, move. yeah, I think, yeah. So, don't go against the light. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, I think my talk has to be heard, not my face to be seen. Yes, sir, <laughs> So I'm just joking, uh, madam. So uh, have you been enjoying your workshop for the last uh, 10 days? Yes. Very good. And I believe this is a penultimate day, so you have uh, today and tomorrow to go. And uh, I suppose you will also enjoy these two days. Uh, when I was asked to give uh, this talk uh, by uh, the people here, I of course chose it. Uh, not that I am a specialist on plant genetic resources, but I should tell you, I started my career uh, working on plant genetic resources and being a disciple of all these guys like Harlan and Vavilo and all those stuff, all those guys hanging, around, hanging from the wall these days. And uh, it was, it so happened that I was anyway going to be in Delhi today and tomorrow, I accepted the offer. But more than that, I think uh, I thought of uh, taking up this offer to uh, talk to introduce you, for those who may not yet know, uh, this uh, sort of uh, concept of what I call as ecological niche uh, uh, modeling or ecological niche concept, the concept of ecological niche and how does it bear on the management or utilization of plant genetic resources. So are you with me on that one? Now how many of you uh, are already aware of uh, the concept of ecological niche as applied in plant breeding or as applied in, uh, let's say, literature in plant genetic resource management in this group? One of, where you are from? I'm from uh, BHU. Please sit down, from BHU. Yes. Okay, good. So uh, one or two may be, but largely most of you are not. But I thought it's very important to now impress upon you how and from where I am now trying to come to introduce this concept and at the fag end of my talk, hopefully you will see how this concept of ecological niche might bear, actually might have an overbearing influence or impact on how we view the plant genetic resources, be it for conservation, be it for management, be it for utilization. Okay. With these few words, let me take you across my talk and uh, hopefully if you have any questions, I don't know if questions are permitted during the course of the talk, you just raise your hand, let us be as informal as we can and so we can have an interactive session. So don't wait till the end of my talk to ask your questions. So I'm going to flash a few slides. Uh, for example, this is a slide of, uh, what is this animal? Someone told correctly? Yeah, very close to koala, red panda, okay? This animal is supposed to be an endangered endemic species of animal and its home range is restricted to this polygon which is uh, painted in red. So you don't find this animal anywhere in the globe, in the face of the planet except for this small patch of land, what you see mostly in South China, okay? Next, if you go to this what is this one? Cobra. King Cobra. King Cobra. The home range of King Cobra, when I say home range, the natural distribution range of this species of uh, snake is uh, restricted to this part of uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia, the Indo-Malian region. And incidentally, just to tell you, if you now go back to literature on King Cobra, you will find that if you ask this question, which is the world capital of King Cobra, the world capital of King Cobra happens to be a small place in the western uh, coast or western Ghats of India, a place called Agumbe uh, in the state of Karnataka. That's the richest place of or habitat, if I have to use the word, of King Cobra. Okay, one more just to now give you an example of a plant since we are talking about plant genetic resources. Here you have a tree called Acer macrophyllum, does not matter which species of uh, this tree is, but all that I want to draw your attention to 
is that if you look at the habitat distribution of SL macrofilum in the entire planet, you will find that it is restricted to a very small patch of land all along the west coast of North America, Canada, North uh, United States and a little bit going into uh, Central America. You will not find the species in the nativity. I mean, it's a different matter that you now pick up this plant and put it in Kew Botanical Garden or the uh, National Botanical Garden in Calcutta and all that. I'm talking about the native distribution of the species. This is only stuck to that small patch of land. Now, I'm not going to give you more example. You can now take many examples, dime a dozen example, and you'll find that for every one of the species of plant that you care to now examine, you'll find that every species of plant on earth, be it animal, be it plant, is sort of locked up in a small part of our planet. The two questions that engages me as an ecologist is, and an evolutionary biologist is, what shapes species distribution in space? Have you ever asked, why are species distributed the way they are? Why is that, that the king cobras are distributed only in this part of the world and not anywhere else? Why is it that the red panda is available only here and nowhere else and so on and so forth? These two questions seem to be a very, very important, very, very fundamental question if one has to talk about the spatial distribution and what have been the drivers of the spatial distribution of species or for the matter for plant or animal, it doesn't matter really. For me at the moment, it doesn't really matter whether we're talking about plant or animal as a species. Do we have any? Uh, suggestions here. What shapes the distribution of species on the geographical surface of our planet? Maybe they have evolved the genetic pattern. Maybe? How they have evolved the that How they have evolved. Any other prompt? It is the ecological niche consists. It is the ecological niche consists. It is the ecological niche. Very good. I am coming to that exactly. Any anything else? Any other sort of answer for the question? Now imagine a situation when the planet was a clean slate. Now you didn't have these species at all. These species evolved as I mentioned. Now we could have two sort of scenario. One, on one fine Sunday, God came and put all of this here, here, here and said, be here. Right? King Cobra means Southeast Asia and South Asia. SR macrofilum means West Coast of California or West Coast of North America. And uh, Red Panda means South China. And that's it. And then these species had to evolve, strategize, and then adapt to those habitat. The other gentleman mentioned that they are the ecological niche of these. Who determined that the South Asian, South Asian region is the ecological or would be the ecological niche of a king cobra. Okay. So we don't know a large slice of history of how species came to occupy different parts of the world. Now we are only taking our history of discussion after that slice, we really, it's a black box for us, just as we now talk about the evolution of our own solar system, either a steady state or a big bang sort of a startup. We don't know anything before that what happened. We are only talking about all events after the Big Bang. Similar is the case here. So there are many, many sort of uh, people who have been involved in discussing this uh, pivotal question. But I would like to introduce you to uh, this morning to this uh, guy, a British zoologist called Hutchinson, who first popularized this concept of what he called as an ecological niche. And as he told, an ecological niche, he mentioned, is the key determinant that now drives or shapes the distribution of any species that you find on Earth. And what is that ecological niche? I'll come to in a little while. And in his definition, which he gave sometime in 1950s uh, thereabouts, he defined ecological niche as an abstract quantity, which according to him is a hyper volume of n dimension that in some way summarizes all the requirements of a species 
whether it be temperature or rainfall or edaphic factors, you know, all that you name, whatever a species wants to now live, you can put that into a high n dimensional hyper volume that is an abstract commodity, but so be it. That is the ecological niche of a species in which the species will thrive. If you pull out one or two of the variables, the species is going to be in a state of disequilibrium and so the species will not survive. Now this concept, though it was very abstract, it began to give a give big handle to people to understand therefore, can I now go about now actually asking a little bit more questions about what an ecological niche is. Okay? Are you with me on this one? So, Hutchinson coined the word ecological niche not for the first time, but he popularizes, popularizes, popularizes uh, this word in terms of its reference that is the key determinant that determines the spatial distribution of species on earth. So let me give you an example of an ecological niche, very colloquial, very uh, uh, sort of day-to-day uh, -day example. Now here is a camel uh, obviously in, the de in a desert. Now can we therefore say uh, what is the ecological niche of a camel? It is a desert, is not it? And when I say ecological niche of a camel is a desert, I now summate in that word desert all the n dimensional hyper volume that Hutchinson spoke of. It can be temperature, it can be precipitation, it can be sunshine hours, it can be dew, it can be 100 things that you, have, you can parameterize. So that is my n dimensional volume that Hutchinson was talking about. Okay? I cannot now decipher every one of them, but I can have an abstract view of what I mean as the ecological niche of a camel being desert. Okay. Now, can I expect a desert, uh, can I expect a camel in this, uh, let us say, wet evergreen uh, tropical forest? If I have understood that the, in the previous slide that the desert is the ecological niche of a camel, can I or not? I cannot unless and until I do a trick of putting such a figure on that, is not it? In reality, in evolutionary context, I cannot expect a camel in the nativity to be distributed in one breath in the desert and on other breath in the wet evergreen forest. Are you with me on this one? So, what is so sacrosanct therefore? What I am saying is, what is so sacrosanct about an ecological niche? that species are bound to it and if you now dislodge that species from that, the species are sort of going to be in a state of disequilibrium. This is a question we are now trying to answer or address here. Now let me uh, take you through again an abstract uh, representation. When I talk about ecological niche, really again because we cannot feel it, we cannot hold it, we cannot measure it, we cannot touch it, we have to talk of it in some sort of extract uh, sort of dimensions. Here I have a three dimensional figure, it is like a kerchief. I hope my kerchief is clean. What you can do is you can take your kerchief and you can sort of uh, pick it up from one end and then sort of ruffle it up and what you find is the kerchief occupies a three dimensional space on my table. right? It has a length, it has a breadth and it has a height. Now let us call this as the ecological niche terrain of any species or that is available for any species to occupy. Okay? Now if you see in the kerchief and in the figure, you have in this sort of uh, undulating surface which is a patch of, let us say, a earth, there is a trough here, a trough here, a trough here, and there are some crest here, which are the high points of my landscape. This is just a physical representation now. Okay? Now, let us switch gear from this ecological terrain to something which is more functionally important for you and me or functionally important for an organism. What is important for an organism? The important thing for any organism in the surface is to gain fitness. When I talk about fitness, I am talking about a quantity 
not the gym fitness, I am talking about a quantity that is the Darwinian fitness. So, every organism would like to maximize its Darwinian fitness and let us say that those fitness maxima are represented by those hilltops okay, for any given species and these troughs are the low minima for any species to occupy. And for example, if any species were to be found here, that species is compelled. What is, what is a compulsion? That species will be compelled if it has to survive and gain fitness to travel up this path and occupy these sort of hilltops. Hilltops is only metaphorical, it is not the physical hilltops, it is the abstract landscape hilltops or the crest which maximize the adaptive landscape or fitness of those organisms. So, they will be driven to occupy those sort of uh, crests or hilltops or peaks if you were to. Is that okay? Now you look at, let me put three organisms, three species and God put them there at time 0. Okay? And these species now decided to move around, jostle around in this planet earth to occupy a space that will maximize their adaptive landscape or that will maximize their fitness landscape. I am going to use the word fitness and adaptive landscape in a, the same sort of a synonymously, so do not be confused. So, let us see what happens. Let us take one of that species. So, what happens through evolutionary time? This movement what you saw is a movement through evolutionary time. From the time it sort of evolved to the time it has equilibrated, that is the sort of span it swiggles and so it moves through evolutionary time. What you see today is those who survived. You have not seen anything that have not survived. So, we are talking only of those which are successful in having survived and attained the adaptive landscapes, right or not? So, all those who have not lived to see the light of today, of course, we cannot speak about them. So, this guy has moved to through the swiggle to the stop and has adopted and has occupied one of the adaptive landscapes that maximizes the fitness of this organism at that particular point. Same is true with another species that goes up and occupies that peak. Same is true with probably the other species and lo and behold, all the three species now have occupied the top of their respective, whatever the respective, we are talking again in very, very abstract language, the respective adaptive landscape that maximizes their fitnesses. So, in short, species fitness would be maximum in its ecological niche than outside of it. So, those hilltops that the three uh, organisms occupied could be called as the ecological niche of that species because it is at that point of space those species were, max, were able to maximize their Darwinian fitness. So, now the answer to the question that you now sort of asked was ecological niche, I can now define an ecological niche in again an abstract language is that subset of all niches available on the world that is able to maximize the fitness, Darwinian fitness of the species concerned. And so, for every one of the species uh, living on earth, be it bacteria, be it fungi, be it plant, be it animal, there is an ecological niche out there that the species have found, adapted, evolved and sort of got a comfort seat in that place. Any shake up, any disequilibrium there is going to realign them and find themselves a new adaptive landscape that will be different from one that was earlier. So, it is very, very, very dynamic, it is not static. What was the fitness landscape 2, 3, 4 million years ago for SR macrophyllum is probably not the same today because between the 2 and 3 million years ago that has elapsed, there have been lots of changes in the biophysical parameters that have made the species readjust 
and therefore realign its space occupation in the entire planet. Okay. So, the summary take home from this is camels would have a higher Darwinian fitness in deserts than in an evergreen forest and so rightfully whether the camel is in Thar desert or Sahara desert or Negev desert, they will probably have fitnesses at the maximum compared to if they were in Amazonian rainforest or equatorial rainforest of Africa or the Indo-Malayan rainforest of Sumatra. Are you with me on that? Okay. Any questions so far? The physical changes might be happen while evolution, right? Physical means? Phenotypic you mean, yes. phenotypic changes. Yes. There could be phenotypic changes or that is sort of uh, provoked to defend themselves or do something for example spines and this and that if you are referring to that. Yeah, surely enough, surely enough. Okay. So, now again all this I am talking in abstract language still, I have not still come to empirical data yet. Now what happens? Um, a matter of fact uh, speaking, if a species decides or if you decide to move that species from its ecological niche away, so I will plot this one here. This is a two dimensional graph, x axis is the distance or not just physical distance, is the abstract distance, the n dimensional hyper volume distance. I move away from its chosen ecological niche parameter far away. If it moves far away that means it is so different from the ecological niche of that species. And as a function of that moving away, I am now measuring what the fitness of the species would be. You follow what I am saying? This is a thought experiment I am now performing here. So, what is your expectation? Let us say I take camel as an example. The Darwinian fitness of camel is maximum where? In the biophysical parameters of the desert, is not it? Now, I move conditions that are very different from the desert all the way to wet evergreen forest. So, what will be the fitness of the camel here, 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 here as a function of? Uh, so it will decrease. So, that is no brainer, now that you have understood it will decrease. The fecundity, the lifetime reproductive success which is a measure of fisherian fitness will now decrease as you move away from the adapted evolved ecological niche of an organism, in this case the camel. Now, this picturization so far is so simple that sometimes you can actually make a prediction that fitness of any species of plant or animal would be highest at the foci of the species ecological niche, the camel and would decrease when you move away from it. This has a bearing, please remember this is a bearing, all of you are agriculture students and we are in some way people who have husbanded crops, is not it? We are in the business of domesticating crops, we are in the business of growing crops out of their home ranges, out of their nativity, you have taken citrus from somewhere, you have taken potato from somewhere, you have taken sugarcane from somewhere, you have taken rice and wheat and maize and so on and so forth from all and sundry. Now you are trying to maximize the fecundity of those in your domesticated environment, it has a bearing simply because what has happened? You have pulled out those species from their nativity which is here and probably pull them out of their comfort zone and what you do, what would you expect? You would expect a decline in their fitness because of this and only this sort of a relationship. Sometimes 
but uh, there it's uh, as ornamental plant their population is very low but when it comes to indian climatic condition yes it is very vigorous anywhere yes. we can see so yes. what is this condition can you just uh, keep your question for another 10 minutes and remind me i'll answer that question uh, i don't have a slide on that uh, to, i have it in some other powerpoint but i'll give you a similar example okay okay now if this uh, abstraction is as simple as it when i and my group was working on this abstraction we found that the statement is so simple but surprisingly there were no evaluation of that prediction what is that evaluation of the prediction that actually you can now see a decline in the uh, fitness as you move the species away from its uh, ecological niche and we found at that time this was about 10 years back or 8 years back that that difficulty was because of the language that we are using because i can't now measure the fitness and say okay i'm moving it so much away from that what is that i'm moving away can i describe it for example uh, tomato where did tomato evolve peru right south america now i have moved tomato from peru all the way to let us say india i know the physical distance but i do do i know the ecological niche distance that i moved tomato from peru to india i have difficulty in measuring that okay at least it was difficult 15 years back or so now i can do that in a minute i can do that i can tell you how far away is the ecological niche distance of uh, tomato or let us say maize or teosinte from mexico to india or whichever crop it doesn't matter to us and so people were trying to ask how can we quantify the ecological niche so that i can answer many of these questions and so was born this big industry of uh, work in the world started by couple of people one of them is a guy called townsend peterson from kansas state university uh, who built up a large number of conceptual model called ecological niche models and uh, using this niche model i'll just come to that in a little while uh people were now able to quantitate the ecological niche shift of a species just by doing this modeling and i am telling you this because if some of you want to now do this modeling as fun you can do it you can self learn it you don't really it's not a formidable sort of stuff you can actually go home and then practice it and do it many of them are free where you can download it and practice it and so the next few minutes i'll talk about the ecological niche model so and it's very very at the at the at the face of it these models are very simple now what does an ecological niche model do now um, first of all let me backtrack and uh, uh, tell you something about uh, the ecological niche now let's say let's go back to our example of camel all of us know now the ecological niche of a camel is desert. desert right now i can first of all i need to quantify i can call desert no i have to quantify the desert by some biophysical parameter what are those biophysical parameters that are easily uh, you know caught by your measurements parameterized i can measure temperature i can measure Huh? Precipitation. Precipitation, sandy soil, domes, then humidity, sunshine hours. So many things you, you can keep on listing. Okay, length of uh, length of the day. Okay, low uh, temperature in the night, temperature of the day. You know there are so many things you can. i don't i don't have to touch the soil i don't have to worry about the soil i'm only talking about the physical parameters 
the atmospheric parameters. I can now enumerate a number of them in a multivariate context. And then I now can say, okay, if I now talk about these are the parameters that parameterize and correctly uh, depict the Thar Desert, will such a character also be true for Sahara Desert? Will it be true for Atacama Desert? Will it be true for Negev Desert? I will now bring all the desert and ask whether this parameters really define well all of these deserts. If, you, if it is defining well all of this desert, my biophysical, biophysical parameter that defines the Thar Desert is likely to be correct, is not it? So, if I can do that and show that look, I do not need to know where I am blind to the map, world map, I only know that these biophysical parameters define a Thar Desert. I can, if I have the data, invoke into the computer and ask where else on the face of earth are such biophysical parameters available, followed? And if they are available, what does it mean? There is a desert there. And if, it, if the desert is there, there must be camel there. Yes or no? That is all. I can use a magic wand here now. Okay? So, let us do this one. That is exactly what the model is doing. So, the first step in the model is I know where the camel is and based on the distribution of the camel, I can now relate all the biophysical parameters of that habitat, in this case the desert. Second, using that I can make the model search for anywhere else in the world where such uh, biophysical parameters are available. And then I can now program the model to tell me, look, which is the place on the earth which is completely identical to the biophysical, biophysical parameters that I have given you in a probabilistic manner. Sahara Desert may be 95 percent similar to Thar Desert. Negev Desert may be 92 percent. There could be Deccan Plateau which is not a desert but may have 60 percent resemblance to a desert. So, I can probabilistically now tell what of those habitats are very, very suitable for camel to be introduced or to even see if camel populations already there in those deserts. Are you with me on this one? These three are the very fundamental seminal uh, elements of <coughs> what I call ecological niche modeling. So, there are different families of model. Again, I will not go into the details of them. One is called genetic algorithm uh, rule set uh, prediction model. Uh, another is meant actually for breeders, but now it is put in disuse. It was started, uh, it was actually developed in a, a CGR institution called diversity GAS, DIVA GAS, there is geo mode. But people today like our group use a model called Maxent it is called maximum entropy model, which is also freeware. You can now look at it. You can download if you want to now uh, explore it a little bit more. And you can do wonders with this uh, maximum entropy model. Now, what basically all of them do? You now take your species of interest, in this, in this case camel or whatever. You have lot of records of the distribution data. Then uh, through the bioclimb layers that these program already have, when I say already have, for the entire world at a resolution of 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer, sometimes at 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer, depending on what is the sort of uh, layers you are in, uh, uh, working on, you have for every part of the world data on temperature, precipitation, solar radiation, snow cover, frost feeders, you know, name it, 
there are 19 odd variables you can use for your predicting the potential niche of camel and the probabilistic suitability of the habitat for camel anywhere in the world all this within one working day with a reasonable computer time reasonable power of the computer and number crunching that is the power of this modeling. Okay. Now, let me give you two or three examples before I go to the next uh, small uh, uh, inroad into my talk. Now, this model became uh, very sort of uh, famous, the ecological niche model sometime uh, in the last decade when uh, there was a lot of, uh, uh, I would say, uh, fear about the outbreak of SARS virus. Some of you may have heard of the SARS virus. Now, the SARS virus is vectored by this uh, animal called the civet cats. People do not know where the SARS virus is going to now uh, attack or where will the epidemic next occur. So, someone who was bright enough told, okay, I do not need to now bother about where it will attack or where the epidemic will be erupted next, but I can do one thing. I can now try to look at the home range of the civet cat and now do an ecological niche prediction of the civet cat and see where else in the world are amenable for civet cat uh, sort of uh, uh, pop, uh, the population of civet cat to exist. And so, I can now develop a risk map of places where in the world you can have a certain degree of probability that you could have SARS. This painted areas are all the painted areas are all what is uh, suitable habitat for the civet cats. None of these areas which are sort of clean, white are home ranges of civet cat. So, there is no way you will get SARS into those areas simply because civet cats cannot live there. It is not the ecological niche of civet cats. Can you believe this one? When this was given, half the world was relieved that they do not have to worry that uh, their country will be prone to a SARS epidemic simply because their country was not, political boundaries of their country was not a habitat, ecological niche for civet cat. Look at the power of this prediction. Uh, people have used this for uh, uh, looking at mosquito spread in the United States is a big uh, nice story published in science, but I will not go into that in detail. Uh, we have done some work on spread of uh, some uh, uh, insect species uh, called uh, woolly aphid on sugarcane. I again, I will not go into the details of it, but I will come to this uh, back uh, to talk about the uh, ecological niche model and an application of that. So, in summary, you can put in your input data. What is the input data? It is a random collection of data of the geo coordinates of occurrence of the species that you find for any species that you are interested in into the program and it will throw you out in a beautiful map pictured, uh, colored uh, whose legend is given here. The red polygons that you see in the map are the sites of extremely high suitability that is the ecological niche parameters of these are very, very suitable in this case if it is some uh, plant. That plant is supposed to be doing extremely well in this red patches, less so in this orange and so on and so forth and this gray areas, this area is totally unsuitable for the species concerned, whatever the species might be. And from there on, you can now do your derivatization, you can do your experiments, you can do whatever planning and this, whatever questions that you have uh, that might engage you in uh, through the application of niche modeling. Okay. So, let me now uh, talk to you for 5-10 minutes on one paper that we published some years ago and this I believe is the first paper in actually predicting or sorry providing a test of the prediction whether or not we can predict the adaptive landscape of a species using niche modeling tool related to the fitness. When I say ecological niche model, the ecological niche model of the species, if I now say it is, it should now be shown that that ecological niche maximizes the fitness of that species there. If you move it away, the fitness declines. That is all. So, this was done in a species of tree called Miristica mulbarica in the Western Ghats 
by a master student of my lab, Sri Prakash. And uh, so that's the tree. Now remember, no one planted this tree there. This is its native distribution, just like uh, the python is distributed somewhere or the king cobra is distributed somewhere. This is distributed in some part of Western Ghats. So, so I am taking you through three steps or four steps of this entire model construction and also the output, just for you to sort of relate of how you actually do this. The first thing of course in any of the ecological niche model building is that you need to know the distribution data, the native distribution data of the species that you are working with, in this case Meristica. So all this, each one of the dots that you see is a geo-coordinated dot indicating the occurrence of the species that Shiv Prakash and his uh, colleagues sort of uh, uh, surveyed in the entire length of Western Ghats, this is about 1300 to 1500 kilometer long stretch. What I want to tell you is, the absence of this species here, the absence of dots here does not mean that the species is not present. But what they did was go around randomly and picked up, if they found trees here, they click, click, clicked their GPS and you got these dots, click, click, clicked and so on and so forth. So this is the input data that you get over the entire Western Ghat that they have traveled in. Now, I will ask a question. What is the ecological niche of the species? From this data, can you now tell what is the ecological niche of the species? Remember, we are talking of one species, Meristica mulberica, and this fellow has now looked at the species distribution in the Western Ghats, and now I am asking this question, so what is the ecological niche of Meristica mulberica? So one can tell about the western uh, coast of, uh, western uh, belt of India or western Ghats of India. That is at a one gross scale. Yes, you are right. Correct? But can we do a little bit more sharper resolution and tell within that is it homogeneous in its distribution? Just like all parts of the desert are they equally uh, habitable for a desert, uh, for a camel? or there are only some parts of the uh, desert which are supremely habitable, some other parts on the fringes are not and all that stuff. So we now look at therefore the modeling where we now take the data points, these uh, data points what you have got sampling locations, we now take the data points from here and we bring back all the biophysical parameters, not physically from the bioclimb data that is already available for 40, 50 years in this program. For 50 years, the bioclimb data is available for 10 by 10, 10 by 10, 10 for not just area, this area for rest of the world. So we now pull those data and build up a ecological niche model which is in the next slide. Or what does it tell you here? Please look at this graph. This is my data points which we have fed. And what it tells you is, look, not all part of the Western Ghat is uniformly a good quote unquote niche for the species, correct? The ones that are painted deepest red are highest in the suitability value and the blue are not at all suitable for the species. If I go by simply the biophysical parameter model as a predictor, they are not. This sea of blue is totally unsuitable for the species of plant. And within this area, you find that some part is a little yellow, some part is red, and so what it only tells you is there is a heterogeneity within a broad landscape. I can't simply say Western Ghat is a niche, it's too gross. What this model does is, it pixelates and tells us for every 10 kilometer, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer, is that pixel good enough, is that pixel good enough and so on and so forth and does all of that number crunching and tells me that look, there is for some reason, don't ask me, only this parts which are very, very good but others are less good, this is 
useless. Clear? Now, what we can do, having done this, can I ask one question? I am not doing an experiment of moving the species out of its ecological niche, but within the random distribution of the species in that terrain, I can pick points of the species. Look here, there are some uh, data points that are lying in the red area. There are some data points that are lying in the yellow area, correct? This yellow areas are less suitable, red areas are more suitable. Can I now go to those trees and ask, how are you doing, man? How many children have you uh, given rise to? What's your genetic diversity? Are you do doing well? What's the state of your health? Can I ask these questions? Right? If I ask the question, what do you expect as a prediction? These guys should be doing better. Right? Because they are in the red spot, which is highly suitable for the species. If you go and ask these trees, they will say, oh my God, I am locked up in a less than ideal ecological niche. So, I am not able to make as many seeds as these guys are doing. You followed? So, the third is look at the adaptive or fitness landscape. So, what we did is we converted the map just to give a pictorial repre representation into what we call as a digital elevation model. And here the peaks are highly suitable ones in the uh, analogy of the kerchief, the lower ones are moderately suitable and the low ones in those brown areas or black, uh, khaki areas are lowly suitable. So we picked up samples of all of the plants from there, there, there and asked whether we can do some fitness measure. All of you are students of genetics here, mostly? Okay. Now I will introduce to you, now when you talk about genetics, one of the most important currency of genetics is fitness. Okay? When you do population genetics, it is invariable that you now talk about fitness as a very important. If you have done quantitative genetics, you will understand what I am talking about. Now how do you measure fitness? This is a million dollar question and people have been grappling with this business of measuring fitness, especially population geneticists. So one of the uh, simple measures, but it is more simply stated than done, is to measure what is the lifetime fecundity of that individual plus the fecundity of all its own progeny. No one can ever do that. So we now adopt something which is more sort of uh, workable. One approach is in the case of plant, look at regeneration per adult tree. How many progeny has the tree left behind? How many seeds has a tomato plant left behind? In terms of how many fruits and how many seeds per fruit and so on and so forth. That is an index of reproductive turnover. Indirect, there are certain measures which we have found to be also very, very interesting. I will talk about two or three just to tell you that some of this you can actually look at when you go back uh, home a little bit more carefully. One of that that I am going to introduce, introduce today, uh, to you today is something called fluctuating asymmetry, another is specific leaf weight and third is genetic diversity. Let me look at fluctuating asymmetry for, uh, for a minute. Now what is fluctuating asymmetry? Now those who have studied a little bit of developmental uh, biology, developmental genetics would know that when we have uh, developmental uh, lethality in the system, in tissues and due to mutational errors and so on and so forth, we now have one symptom and that symptom is if we talk about bilaterally symmetrical organism where you can draw a line through the nose of the bridge and you can now measure to the left and to the right, what happens is in a perfectly symmetrical bilaterally symmetrical organism, the modulus of left to right will be 0, left minus right will be 0. If it is uh, something is more than that, of course it will be greater than 0, either plus or minus, but since we are taking modulus, it will be without a sign. 
Now, lot of people have earlier shown that if you now move away from 0 to increasing asymmetry, where it is not symmetrical, it is asymmetrical, the fitness drops inversely. So, you can go back and uh, measure uh, how, what is the fluctuating asymmetry between the nose of your bridge to the left and right. If you are symmetrical, you are very, very fit. If you are asymmetrical, you may be less so. I am sorry to tell you this. I know I have disturbed you. I am sure ma many of you will go back home and do that. <laughs> but this is a human subject and a guy who popularized this is Andrew Moller, a Swedish uh, guy. He became very popular in the 70s about this business of fluctuating asymmetry. If you look at advances in genetics, annual review of genetics, a flood of papers in that area by this guy. But to talk about less exciting thing, you can put over Mona Lisa a sunflower leaf and do the same thing. And from the midrib, at a certain latitude, you can now measure what is the left modulus and right and then do all of that. And you will find that what is true for Mona Lisa is also true for a sunflower leaf. And this is a very, very simple way of now showing whether a plant that you have in front of you is actually good at health or not, or there is something troubling it. And one of the troubling thing would be a stress, a stressor like abiotic, biotic or a ecological niche that is less than desirable for that species. Okay. The second measure is as a physiologist also, a plant, the most important thing of a plant to maximize children, that is maximize productivity or fecundity is how much carbon it can now assimilate. That is dependent upon how thick the leaf is for a given surface area. So that is called specific leaf weight. How much weight is subtended per square millimeter of the leaf? If you have more weight, that is there is lots of mesophyll, you have lots of chloroplasts making lots of carbon, you have a higher sort of leaf assimilatory ability. And so in a niche that is highly suitable, you will have a high specific leaf weight in a niche which is less suitable, you will have low suit, uh, specific leaf weight and it relates to once again how much fecund that species could be. And third of course is a very valuable parameter on gene diversity or genetic diversity, however you measure it. People have shown that as a function of increasing genetic diversity, the fecundity in terms of seed number, seed mass increases. So if you measure this genetic diversity, you are likely to find that in a very highly suitable habitat, the genetic diversity is going to be very high. In a low suitable habitat or where the ecological niche is less than suitable, the genetic diversity is less. And this in turn will now affect the fitness. So all these are summative in some manner, which of course we have no uh, data, I mean uh, uh, hang on today. So these are the data from our own study for that species of plant, Meristica malbarica. And here on the x-axis is lined up the habitat suitability index based on the modeling that was done. And on the y-axis is measured the regeneration per adult tree. Just uh, it is enough to mention here that look at it. Within the range of the distribution of the species in the western guards, what we have been able to demonstrate is that trees of uh, uh, Meristica that are located in highly suitable habitat had a higher regeneration on an average compared to those which had, uh, which were in a low or poorly suitable habitat which had very low regeneration. This is just one very, very, I would say dr dramatic results to show that if you just move them even a little bit away from where they are supposed to be you now compromise, the species compromises on its fecundity. Uh, I will skip this one, but if you look at the fluctuating asymmetry, uh, blue are the individuals coming from highly suitable habitat from the modeling experiment, poor is the, the red is a poor. What you find is when you now look at the populations from the individuals from the highly suitable habitat, on an average their fluctuating asymmetry is lesser than compared to those coming from poor. So 
for some reason maybe there is a genetic lethality maybe there is developmental res recessive lethals accumulated in those plants you have larger fluctuating asymmetry in trees that are in poorly suitable habitat compared to highly uh, suitable habitat and then if you look at genetic diversity measure you find that on an average the plants or trees that are in highly suitable habitat in the western ghat have a high genetic diversity compared to those which are in poorly suitable habitat now this all puts a complete picture to suggest that and to show empirically for the first time that if you move away species from its ecological niche you are going to suffer on the plant or on the organism a depreciation of the fecundity as here mentioned by both direct and indirect measures of fitnesses so summing up ecological niche what was in abstract notion told by hutchinson in 1957 does reflect the adaptive landscape of species as we now claim in this study and to that extent it appears that he was justified over 60 years back that the ecological niche of a species is key determinant of the distribution of species so if you now have a species that is poorly performing what will be the directional selection of that species individual to move away from there to a place where it can maximize its fecundity isn't it so in nature this sort of a dyna dynamic uh, 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 packing or dynamic readjustment of the space occupied by individuals all the time happen to see that i am in a place where i can become more fecund now i come to the last part of my talk which is probably the most important in the in the context of what we are now talking just about 5 uh, minutes i would like to sort of spend here and this i would like to do with a interactive uh, uh, in a interactive manner i am giving you here a picture which is a schematic not my publication our publication but it could be as well uh, the ministrika malbarika picture it could be this handkerchief uh, taken in a photograph where what you see in this picture is uh, in a three dimensional space you have heterogeneous heterogeneity with respect to the terrain map and just to reiterate the red color in any such map indicates highly suitable then uh, lesser uh, that is your yellow or orange lesser so and so and so forth the blue is unsuitable so that's the sort of index of suitability so what does this indicate this indicates the niche terrain or fitness landscape of a plant let's say we are talking of a plant now agreed question number 1 that i want to ask you quiz in which of this entire distribution space in terms of color themes will that species whatever the plant that we have chosen uh is expected to perform best in terms of fecundity red, red or blue red. very good you have passed the examination second question where do you think and this is very important where do you think the individuals of the species whatever the species might be whatever the plant might be will be fighting for to occupy the space in this landscape orange red red, red, red. and then orange red. and of course not in blue at all so if i were to go and then you don't know but i have a map if i sent all of you to this part of whatever part of the world it is and asked you to measure lay 10 feet by 10 feet or maybe whatever dimension and asked you to now measure the density of the individuals of this tree species uh 5 minutes can i take era 5 minutes okay or you tell me when i am done okay so uh if you were to go and put a 10 feet by 10 feet plot and then i ask you to now measure the density of the trees <coughs> uh in that plot and then come back home and then i now sort of take the data from you if i now put the densities in this entire area 
where do you think the densities are going to be highest? Red. It's no brainer, right? You got it. Now all what you have told now tells me that look, that there is a intimate, uh, it's an it's entwined completely that the ecological niche of a species now drives what should be the distribution of the species, what should be the density distribution of the species, what therefore would be the fecundity of the species and remember as I don't know lots of students are geneticists here, you also know that a whole bunch of genetics is a function of number of mating individuals, isn't it? So you have more mating individuals per unit area, there is a greater degree of intermating and all that, all those consequences are there. So you can now keep on sort of pulling them out and so on, you can go on. Uh, now this is the start. Now I am going to ask you one question. Remember this is the terrain of a plant, of one plant or one species of a plant, whatever that might be. I am going to ask you this next question. I have put here already an intent that I have in mind that this plant is a primary producer, isn't it? All plants are a primary producer. On primary producer you have what? On every primary producer, on every plant what are there? The second trophic level and so let me now put a consumer which is either a pest or a pathogen. Okay. Now I am going to ask if I knew that this is my terrain adaptive landscape of a primary producer which is a plant, can I predict the niche terrain and therefore the fitness landscape of its consumer? What is the quick answer? What is the quick answer for that? Huh? So please, uh, please listen to the question again. I am asking now, given this, can I predict what will be the distribution pattern of a caterpillar? A caterpillar wants to maximize its fecundity also, just like the plant. So where on the space of this primary producer, assuming that this caterpillar is feeding on this plant, where on this space of this primary producer in the heterogeneous pixelate that you have got, will this caterpillar be found more probably red, right or not? So we it would be selected to overlay the niche terrain of the primary producer. So if you did not do anything, you can simply copy paste this one which is what I have done as a demonstration that in in, in, in uh, large amount of you know expectation fairness, I would be better off by saying that the distribution space of this species of caterpillar which let us say is a extreme case of monophagous one would be now similar to this one, correct. But then do you expect the plant to keep quiet? and uh, remain silent. So what would the plant do? The plant would generate some response to such pressure. How can it respond? It can now generate some responses by producing defense compounds, secondary metabolites. It can now produce thorns, it can produce spines, it can produce so many other things that will deter the herbivore. So, if the plants are going to produce secondary metabolites, I can ask this question, can we therefore predict what will be the terrain map of the secondary metabolite produced by the plant in consequence to the insect homing on to the primary producer's terrain? Red? It would be red. I can again copy paste and put this one. What happened is when I first was thinking about this and when this was conceptualized, 
it came to a sh as a shock to me that in one stroke you can actually do a lot of prediction and actually test up those predictions by saying that look if you have now quantified and have been able to successfully predict the ecological niche of any plant you care to you can roughly now quantify the terrain map of its pest and pathogen and in turn you can roughly map the genes or metabolites that would be evolved in response to the defense for those pests and diseases okay now i'll just you know how much time i have got 2 minutes 5 minutes so tell me 5 minutes. minutes yes so you please go back to your genetics 101 or plant breeding uh, 101 where do you go to look for the genes for resistance for rust in wheat where why i know where where do you go to pick the genes for resistance to phytophthora you know uh, wilt for potato in the native niche you go all the way to you know south america to go and do the germplasm collection from the potato uh, in that place right or the wheat in that place and for the matter for any crop for citrus you go to northeast india right for banana you go to northeast india and so what is happening is if you remember the floors genes to gene concept in all these places of their native distribution which is supremely adaptable you have a very highly dynamic evolution going on because that is where the highest amount of pestilence is there and there is where the highest amount of responses are there so the number of genes alleles the number of private alleles that you have in those systems or those regions will be the highest so the take home message from this is for genes or metabolites one would be best guided by niche model predictions on where to collect the genetic resources from that now can give you a big big lead in managing the genetic resources by being guided by the ecological niche distribution map that you would now create for a species that you would want uh, that you are interested in now since time is short <coughs> what i'll do is i'll wrap up by just telling you that uh, this model prediction what i just now gave you was uh, uh, demonstrated by us in another species i won't go into the details of that in a plant that produces an anti cancer alkaloid and what we showed is actually that those habitats that were excellently suitable for that species were the ones that produces highest metabolite compared to those spots which were poorly suitable indicating that look as a bio prospector i can be guided to get the germplasm from sites which are poorly sorry the sites which are highly suitable for the species because it is in these that the genes would be selected for maybe the penetrance the expressivity of the genes are higher maybe the epigenetic mechanisms playing here are better than those in this case and therefore it will be better off for me to now pick up my germplasm from here than here and here though the species may be distributed in all other parts of the uh western ghats so i would like to recall vavilo that uh, he was no way uh, far away from whatever we have just now concluded except that he wasn't aware very in a formal sense of the ecological niche uh, sort of model operating but many of his sort of uh, rules of thumb seem to be now upheld by the formal predictions formal theorization of ecological niche uh, uh, concept i am really running out out, out of time now in this study i just want to because you asked me this question in this study we picked up 125 points of uh, rubber coming from brazil and then splashed it across the world and what we found is rubber actually can find itself in many parts of the world including in southern part of india but not that it is naturally available there you can actually now cultivate rubber in those places 
using this modeling to find out which is the place elsewhere in the world that is suitable for rubber. Again, for want of time, I will not go into the details. But I will leave you with this one paper which was published in Nature last month. It is a very interesting paper. Please read it. It is a very beautiful paper. I wish I was the author of this paper. It, co it is called Potential Adaptive Strategies for 29 Sub-Saharan Crops Under Future Climate Change. All that they have done is used the ecological niche model uh, predictions for 29 uh, crops in Sub-Saharan and then modeled for future climate change and then they have come out come about with some very, very lucid, I would say, finding. So for crop geneticists, breeders, people who are interested in germplasm, uh, I think it will be a very good sort of uh, paper to read about uh, that connects what I talked to you about. I wanted to talk a little bit, but for want of time, I will not go into the details. Okay. So summing up further, ecological niche of a species reflects the adaptive landscape of the species. It has interesting implications. Three implications that I sort of am uh, gleaming through the surface is mining genes and metabolites, which we are already doing in a lab, planning for conservation. I have not spoken, but we work on that, and for prospective management of genetic resources. Hopefully, a little bit of that is rubbed on you. So I thank uh, a number of my coll collaborators. Uh, Naraini uh, is a modeler. She is with uh, that guy whom I talked about. Uh, Townsend Peterson in Kansas. Ravi Kant is, um, was my PhD student, but an, now a an, uh, uh, conservation geneticist at ATRI in Bangalore. Shiv Prakash was at Concordia, Montreal. Now he is back in Delhi uh, uh, working for Nature Conservancy. Dr. Ganesha is my longtime collaborator, uh, doing a lot of mapping work, uh, who has done a lot of work on uh, digitization of Indian plant resources. Shiv Prakash, uh, sorry, Raghavendra is a guy who did the last part uh, trying to sort of develop an empirical model for the talcoid and uh, he happens to be one of our collaborators from ETH Zurich. And a uh, lot of this work are funded by Department of Biotechnology and North South Center. Thank you so much. I'm sorry for, <laughs> I s uh, I'm sorry for a little bit of uh, spilling.